So, my name is Zach. I'm an engineer at Flux. Uh, this is going to be a very serious talk with lots of technical details. So we're going to start with some numbers. First, been a Rust station since 2018. Second, been a Nix user for about nine months, not very long. Uh, been a documentation team member for about six months. Uh, an engineer at Flux for about four months and an irredeemable nerd for about 32 years. So this talk is going to be about language bindings, uh, specifically my experience exploring Rust bindings to Nix. Nix, written in C++. Rust, notably not C++. As you can imagine, this makes things difficult. So why have I done this to myself? Flux uses Rust. Flux also uses Nix. I don't know, profit? <laughs> uh, so, language bindings. Let's set aside Rust and C++ for a moment and think about why you would want to write language bindings in the first place. So, let's say that language A is the language that you're writing in, and language B is the language that you're binding to. And if you need a mnemonic to keep track of this, just remember B is for binding and C is for cookie. <laughs> so, uh, why would you want to write language bindings? Um, so there's a number of reasons, uh, some better than others, obviously. Um, one example is that the only implementation of something is written in language B, so in this case, Nix. Um, and you just have to live with that, and if you want to use that functionality, other than just like shelling out to it, you write some language bindings. Another one is performance. So let's say language B is faster. Uh, a good example of this is the Python ecosystem. So a number of scientific and data science libraries are written in C, Fortran, whatever, and they're just kind of a Python wrapper around this. Uh, I did this myself in my PhD doing quantum mechanics simulations, wrote that in Rust, wrapped it in Python, worked like a charm. The next one is compatibility. So um, let's say that you have, uh, let's say that you want to parse a flake reference. Uh, at Flux, we had our own implementation that was written in Rust. Um, and regardless of which one was more correct, it was probably Nix, let's be real, um, there's going to be some differences between how Rust does it uh, in your implementation and how Nix does it. And so just by virtue of there being differences, you have bugs for your users. So you probably just want to do what everybody else does and be compatible with the rest of the ecosystem, so language bindings. The next one is avoiding reinventing the wheel. Um, this one is related to the previous one. So somebody's already written something that parses flake references. Why would I want to do that again? Um, the next one is you're on a vision quest. Um, you cannot reach inner peace until you force these two languages with all of their differences to reconcile with one another. Not a common use case, but a use case nonetheless. Next one is language A good, language B bad. Uh, you know, typical language war bullshit. Um, the last one is pure, unadulterated hubris. And by that, I mean nobody told you not to before you started. So, what makes this difficult? Let's go over some of the details between Rust and C++. First one, they have different ways of sharing interfaces. Rust has traits, C++ has uh, abstract classes or something like that. Uh, I wrote my first C++ like a month ago, and I'm still trying to get the smell off of me. Boom, roasted. Uh, I kid. Uh, so take everything I say here with a heavy dose of skepticism. Uh, the next one is they have different ways of reusing functionality. Rust has generics. C++ has templates. There's some difference between those two. I don't know. Ask a C++ person. Next one is they have different ways of representing, you know, function calls and putting stuff in and out of registers, that kind of thing. And then for the next few, we're going to talk about uh, strings as an example. So they have different type layouts in memory. So Rust and C++ uh, basically define strings in the same way. Uh, you have a data structure that contains a pointer to some buffer in memory that contains the string's contents. Uh, you have some number telling you the maximum allowable length of that string basically the length of that buffer, and you have another number that tells you the current length of the string. And so uh, even if those pieces of data are exactly the same between the two languages, 
they may not be in the same order in memory. So that's obviously a problem. The next one is that they have different invariants and semantics. Uh, so for instance, in Rust, it is a bug for you to ever have a string that does not contain valid UTF-8. And so if you just give it a bunch of bytes to try to construct a string, it will first check that it's valid UTF-8. Whereas, at least to my knowledge, that's not necessarily true for C++ strings. Um, Rust famously has a borrow checker. C++ does not, even if there are other ways of enforcing memory safety. And then there's a whole host of other stuff that makes this really, really tricky to get right. So, is it impossible? Obviously, I'm standing in front of you, so the answer is no. So, how do you do it? You chain some poor, tortured soul to a chair and force them to write a bindings generator. Uh, and so basically the way this works is that your bindings generator will uh, read in your language B code, say Nix in this case, and then generate some shim uh, in the language that you're writing in. This would be Rust in this case. Um, and then your code will then consume that shim. Uh, and so necessarily this means that uh, language A and language B must already have some way of communicating with each other. And that's often through some kind of C API. Uh, like York said yesterday, it's been around since 1970. People use it a lot. So uh, let's talk about a few bindings generators in the Rust ecosystem. The first one is called CXX. So this is a Rust crate that uh, basically will generate C++ bindings for you for types that you specify manually. So uh, you basically tell it, I want these data types and these functions, and it generates Rust uh, equivalents for you. The next one is auto CXX, and this is basically a wrapper around CXX. And this one is kind of more useful for larger projects that you want to use more of their functionality. So CXX, if you want like a function or two, you have to write something manually, not a big deal. Uh, if you want to use, I don't know, let's take something crazy like Chromium you want to generate bindings to all of Chromium, you're not going to write that up by hand, right? Auto CXX, you tell it an entire namespace, and you get bindings for that entire namespace. Um, the next two are for C interop, just kind of included here for completeness. So bind gen is when you want to create a Rust interface to a C library. Uh, it'll generate bindings for you. And then C bind gen does the exact opposite. So you give it your Rust code, and it generates a C interface that can be consumed by whatever other language. And of course, remember, C is for cookie. So CXX. Uh, this is the one that I used for trying to make these C++ bindings works, uh, work. And basically, the way this one works is that it doesn't generate one shim, it generates two. Um, so you have a C++ shim that consumes the C++ and exposes a C interface. Then you have a Rust shim that consumes that C interface and exposes a Rust interface, and then you talk to that. And so, again, this necessarily means that there's going to be something lost in translation because you're going from C++ through C and then back up to Rust. C can't represent all, all the stuff that C and, uh, C++ and Rust can natively. So, I started binding. <laughs> uh, so this is what it's like to actually use CXX. Uh, basically, you write this part. Uh, you write a header file that includes all the headers from whatever project you're binding to, uh, in this case, Nix. Uh, and then you have another file uh, I've called nix.cpp in this case that contains any implementations or like adapters that you want. Uh, and then you have to write a build script. And so the build script uh, does two things. Uh, one, it compiles your Rust code. Uh, but it also uh, does all the package config and C compilation, adding any um, flags that you want, that kind of stuff. So when I started this, uh, I'd never done any of that before. Um, so that was uh, a little painful. Um, like I said, I wrote C++ for the first time like a month ago. Um, but yeah, so all said and done, there's kind of a lot of ceremony to get anything working at all. But it is possible. So. Let's parse a flake reference. Uh, I chose this example because it's very small and it will illustrate a lot of the issues with this approach. So essentially what we're doing is a round tripping a string here. So I'm gonna parse it and then I'm just gonna print it. Easy peasy, right? Wrong. <laughs> so problem one, opaque types. This is actually kind of like the main problem. So anything that's not 
plain old data, gets turned into an opaque type. An opaque type is basically a bag of bytes at a memory address, and that's about all you know about it. You don't know any of the internal details, whatever. So even esoteric, rarely used types like strings are considered not plain old data, and so they get turned into an opaque type. That sucks. The next problem is that you can't access member functions or attributes on opaque types, and you also uh, can't return opaque types directly to Rust, at least. Uh, and that means that you have to wrap them in some kind of pointer, and also that sucks. So what this means is that you have to write so, so many wrappers. You have to write wrappers to return values behind pointers if they aren't already behind one. You have to write uh, wrappers that uh, access member attributes, so basically you're writing getters and setters. Uh, and then you also have to write functions that uh, just call member functions or like methods. Uh, and so this brings us to one of the first big takeaways, which is that if you think you're going to write bindings to Nix uh, without writing any C++, I regret to inform you that is not the case. So let's take a look at what some of the C++ looks like. Uh, here's the header file. Uh, you can see that I have these two, fi or these two functions. These are wrappers uh, that I had to write. I'm pulling in all my flake stuff uh, in the header files. And the C++ function, don't try to read all this. This is just, you can literally see I'm just calling the native parse flake ref function and then returning a pointer to the flake ref. That's it. And then I'm also just calling the flake ref to string method and then converting it into a Rust string. Um, and so this brings us to the next takeaway, which is that at some point this begins to look like object-oriented C code. Um, and so if you've ever looked at, for instance, the C Python uh, implementation, you'll see uh, for a lot of like classes, there's a function that takes a pi object or a pointer to one as the first argument, and then everything after that are the actual arguments that you would pass to that method. Uh, and you kind of see this, what would emerge into the same pattern here when I call uh, parse flake ref uh, or flake ref to string, I have to pass in that flake ref to flake ref to string so that I can then do something to it. Um, and so this begs the question, why am I using C++ to essentially write C code, uh, which will then be consumed by Rust, uh, probably wrapped into a, a nicer, like more rusty interface that kind of mimics the C++ interface that we originally had. Uh, food for thought. Uh, it certainly doesn't sound all that efficient, and it's much less ergonomic than just using C++. So the Rust side, you need this one module with this macro applied to it that basically just tells you what you're going to bring in from C++. Uh, it's not that big a deal. And then the main function here, also not that big a deal. I parse the flake ref, turn it into a string, and I just print it, right? So after all this song and dance, we finally did it. We round trip to string. Yay. So uh, I'm not the first person to make Rust bindings to Nix. There's this project called Harmonia, uh, and there's a Rust crate inside of it uh, called libnix store. And so what Harmonia is, is it's a binary cache implementation written in Rust, and it binds to the Nix store APIs. So I knew that this existed before I started this project, uh, and I even looked at it for inspiration when I got stuck. So if you go look at the Rust code that they write for their bindings to the Nix store, you'll notice that all of the inputs and outputs are primitive types, not C++ types. And now I know why, and it's because Using the actual C++ types fucking sucks. So is this bad or is this rad? It's kind of both. You might even say that it's Brad. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's rad that it's possible, um, but it's pretty much bad in every other respect. Uh, it's really not ergonomic to use. It's kind of a pain in the ass to get started. Uh, it's just, it just kind of sucks. So like, don't do it. Um, which brings us to Operation Cookie Monster. So uh, yesterday, Yorick talked about this C API. Uh, and uh, basically, I went ham on it uh, with Rust. Um, so he talked about these Python bindings uh, that bind to this API so that you can use Nix from Python. 
And Operation Cookie Monster, you can think of as the Rust equivalent if somebody didn't know what they were doing and didn't talk to anybody about it and did it in a weekend. So, expectations. Every relationship deserves a talk about expectations. And if you and I are going to go study, we should have that conversation. Uh, quality, very clearly weekend project, bad. <laughs> Stable, hell no. Uh, it's built against a PR. Uh, the next build for this literally pulls in the commit from the PR, so if there's a rebase, I don't know, bye bye. Uh, uh, is it rusty? No. <laughs> there's um, mutability everywhere. Um, so let's take a look at how this worked out. Um, phase one, make it work. So the goal here is to evaluate an expression. Uh, don't read this. This is just there to give you an idea of like the order of magnitude of code. Um, the first third of this is just doing initialization. The last third is doing garbage collection. And somewhere in the middle is actual evaluation. Uh, it's one big unsafe block. And <laughs> if you love Rust, you're looking at this going, my boy, <laughs> what have they done to my boy? Um, so what did I have to sacrifice to make this all work? Only a little bit of my dignity. Um, so like I said, it's one big unsafe block. It's basically C code written in Rust. Um, there's about, it's roughly 70 lines. Not all of that is shown. Uh, there's like three functions that are doing uh, conversions between C and Rust string types. Um, uh, it's really helpful that Rust has two string types. That's not at all annoying. Um, so uh, there's also kind of different styles of error handling. Uh, so up here is kind of Go style error handling. So I don't know if you have binoculars, you can see at some point there's a comment that says, are we writing Go now? Uh, because basically you have C functions that return uh, something that could be an error, you check that it's an error, and then you move on with life if it's not. So um, let's see. Uh, this is actually way easier than CXX. So CXX, you have to write all these wrappers and handlers and stuff like that. Uh, bind, so I'm using bindgen for this. Uh, this, you write a header to include nix, and then you get Rust functions. Like It's that easy. It was very, very simple. Because uh, Rust has native C interop. So, Phase two, make it good. Uh, so a lot of this stuff revolves around Nix, uh, like value types. Um, and so basically what I did was I wrapped all this into a more rusty interface. Um, so I have this Nix value type. It basically contains a, uh, a pointer to the actual type returned by uh, the FFI layer. And then I also have this context thing, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So rather than having a big massive unsafe block. The unsafe is actually limited to very, very small subsets of the actual code. Uh, it's just the first line here where it, uh, it says unsafe FFI nix alloc value. So basically, get me a value from the nix side, then I immediately check whether that pointer is null, and if it's not, I move on with life. If it is, bad news. Um, you just kind of bail. So um, it's a much more targeted use of unsafe. Um, and for those of you that think that unsafe Rust is basically just C or C++, uh, also not correct, I'm sorry. Uh, Rust will happily tell you that the type of your null pointer is not correct. Uh, it even has multiple functions for creating different kinds of null pointers. Um, sure. <laughs> uh, so going back to making it good, uh, the previous 70 line thing is now this first block up here. Um, you can see that uh, I create this context thing, which is kind of a gnarly type. Again, I'll explain that later. Um, I create a guard for initializing all of this lib expert stuff, create a handle to the store, an evaluator state, create a value, uh, and initialize it with uh, a string that contains an expression. And I just convert it to JSON, and that's it. We're done. So the whole implementation is much, much lighter. <laughs> so the pre previous one was 70 lines. This one is over 300. Uh, so it's a lot more, but it's also doing a lot more. So uh, all of this, all said and done, uh, took me about a day, day and a half to write. Um, but that's also partially because I don't know anything about Nick's internals. I don't know how evaluation works. So part of that was just me kind of bumbling around trying to make things actually turn into strings. Uh, I also don't really know anything about C or C++. I've never used package config or any of that stuff. Uh, so you can imagine that it would take a couple of knowledgeable engineers not that long to write a ergonomic, safe, uh, 
Rust interface to all of this. So this brings us to some of the problems with this approach. So one of the big ones is that Rust destructors aren't fallible. So what that means is that uh, Rust destructors are implemented in the drop trait. Um, and uh, this method called drop doesn't have a return value, uh, meaning like it can't tell you that there was an error other than just crashing. <laughs> um, so uh, when you create one of these values, it's actually reference counted under the hood, uh, one of these Nix values specifically. Uh, it's reference counted. And so when you destroy it, you need to de decrement that reference count. Um, and with the current version of the C API, um, that can fail for some reason. I don't know. Ask York. <laughs> uh, so what am I doing to solve that problem? I don't know. Nothing. <laughs> I'm, right now, I'm just eating the error. So that's something that would probably need a more robust solution before it can be used by, I don't know, real people. Um, so the next problem is carrying state around everywhere. So this comes back to this context thing. So uh, C++ can kind of raise an exception at any time. Uh, and catching a C++ exception in Rust is a bad time. You're probably just going to crash or something even worse. Um, so uh, exceptions are caught by uh, the C API uh, and then stored in this Nix C context type. Uh, and so that means that uh, you basically pass around this context type literally everywhere. Um, and so the first version, that 70 line big unsafe block, was just passing that into everything. Uh, and in the more rusty version, I stuck it in every value type so that I didn't have to pass it around everywhere. Um, and if I was going to do that, if I was going to do this again, um, I'd probably do the same thing with the evaluator state because that also gets passed to, into just about everything. And so you end up, with, like I said, with this pretty gnarly type, uh, manually drop. Uh, this is the Rust way of telling the compiler. Uh, when I drop this thing, I actually have something that I want to do other than just like deallocating the memory. Uh, RC, reference count, ref cell, pretend like this is not mutable, but it, it's actually mutable. Um, and then I have this Nix, basically the Rust version of the Nix C context type. So takeaways. Uh, <coughs> Rust bindings to Nix are actually really easy with a C API. Um, unfortunately, you need mutable state just about everywhere. Um, so there's kind of an impedance mis mismatch between the two. But having a C API at all is really, really nice. Also, don't use C++ bindings. They're bad. <laughs> uh, so that brings us to the end. Uh, I appreciate your attention. Uh, you can find me in a few different places. Uh, I'll have the code for this available on GitHub after the talk. I just need to make it public. Uh, and then the slides. Ooh. Uh, uh, the slides also will be available. Um, so with that, I appreciate your attention. Uh, do we have any questions? All right, any, any questions? Really? None? Back there. Oh, sorry. Over here. Be right up. I've stunned you all into silence. First, okay. All right. I was, I was hey. uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so you've talked about carrying state and having this context everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, couldn't you just write wrappers again for checking if an, there's an error in the context after making a call to the binding? I mean, you could. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah, I okay. guess. So, yeah. I mean, basically, the whole one of the kind of defining features of C++ and Rust is this uh, RAII thing, resource acquisition is initialization. So you create something, and when it goes out of scope, it gets destroyed so that you don't have to do that manually. So it's, it, yes, it's possible, but it would be less ergonomic than just stuffing it into the value type. All right, over here. Yep. Um, so. As with the C binding stuff uh, yesterday, have you tried the, the flip, anything with the flip side of this of, uh, of trying to um, you know, uh, call Rust from the C stuff? Not or at C++. all. <laughs> no? okay. uh, basically, I got the evaluation working, and then I was like, well, job done. Uh, so I kind of wanted to show that it was possible, and that it was easy, and that it, uh, you actually could make a nice Rust interface. 
And then I figured I would stop there and probably talk to somebody, like an adult who knows what they're doing here, and see if it's valuable, or uh, probably also wait for the PR to be merged so that I'm not fixing things on every rebase. <laughs> Any more questions? So in the spirit of Operation Cookie Monster, after this, there's actually cookies down at the flocks table uh, after this. I, so. I can confirm that. Yes. I may or may not have had one. Yeah. Is the plan that there would be something on the hack day tomorrow with regards to this? Uh, I actually won't be around for hack day because I'm going straight to RustConf where I'm also speaking. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, jet lag, cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, yep. Thanks. Uh, Don't clap just yet. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, maybe a stupid question, but do you think it will be possible to have something like the what the Linux kernel is currently doing, having Rust in the Linux kernel, also for Nix, that we have Rust beside the C++ code? Uh, I would say it's certainly possible. Um, whether there's uh, a good reason to do that, debatable. Uh, whether there's buy-in to do that, almost certainly not. Um, so, uh, yes, question mark, but probably not. Um, yeah, there's, uh, I, yeah, anyway, probably not. Now you can clap. Yeah. Thank you, Zach.